Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 15th meeting of 2018. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item four in private, which is consideration of our work programme. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. Agenda item number two is our third evidence session on the management of Offenders Scotland. We'll refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And welcome Liz Dugan, partner with Brasenall and Orr. Leanne McQuillian, President of the Edinburgh Bar Association, Dr Louise Brangan, Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Howard League, Scotland, Douglas Thompson, Criminal Law Committee, the Law Society of Scotland, and last but not least, Dr Hamner, Graham, Lecturer in Criminology, Scottish Centre of Crime and Justice Research at University of Stirling. You're all very welcome. And can I thank you in particular to those who provided written evidence. Um, as I always say, and the committee members always um, confirm, it's very, very helpful to have that in advance of our evidence session. We now move straight to questions starting with John Finney. Thank you, Convener, and, and uh, you're correct. I have, uh, it's questions from Howard League Scotland, two or three, if I may, Dr Rangan, that to, to kick us off. You expressed concern that potentially this could be, and I quote here, a, an expansion rather than reduction um, that will come into place. But I, I think it's in your second paragraph, you say, fundamental questions and aims of the bill remain to be clarified. What are the precise underlying penal rationales motivating the expansion of electronic monitoring in Scotland? Do you have any notions yourself what they might be at all? Well, what we, and Heritage like Scotland, are very pleased to be invited and to speak on this bill. And given that it's such a considerable piece of legislation, one of the one of our issues is, well, first of all, we, of course, welcome the extension of electronic monitoring. And we're not opposed to the refinement and to the introduction of GPS. But one of the concerns that we've raised is about some of the opaqueness around why we might want these expansions. And as we said, if it is to do with some of the institutional issues, so those are our staggeringly high imprisonment rate, our court's huge and consistent reliance on the use of imprisonment that has remained steadfast across certainly the last 20 years, then this could be an effective and important means to reduce that. That's absolutely important. We talk about Scotland's incredibly high imprisonment rate, and sometimes I get concerned that that turn of phrase, it has become like a turn of phrase because it's almost threadbare from overuse, but we should remain alarmed that despite lots of the progressive moves around Scottish penal policy, our imprisonment rates, our per capita imprisonment rates, remain some of the highest in Western Europe. So if we can use GPS and electronic monitoring to address that by releasing people who are otherwise sent to prison on remand, by increasing the number of people on temporary release, by encouraging the courts to use it as an alternative to a carceral sanction, then this is an exciting and promising platform for that. If, however, it is to do with increasing public protection, risk of individuals, increasing surveillance in the community, if it is just used as a technological fix, then what we're concerned about is that we'll have an expansion of the, so the net widening and up tariffing, we'll have an expansion of the number of people in the deeper end of the criminal justice system. So what we've seen in Scotland over the last 10, 15 years is that the expansion of the community sentence has happened and that's to be welcomed, but that's actually been at the expense of the fine. The rate at which the courts use the prison sentence has not changed at all. It's remained between 13 and 15%. So unless the bill addresses very explicitly to say this is about reducing the imprisonment rates of targets groups like long-term prisoners, remand prisoners, then we're not certain that it's going to achieve more than its surveillance aims in terms of tackling imprisonment rates. And so what we'll have is we'll draw more people into the criminal justice system so less people will get a fine, which is a less intrusive punishment, and more people will receive something more onerous and more intrusive, like GPS, more community sanctions, while the prison system, the prison rates remain unchanged. So the risk here is between are we trying to reduce our imprisonment rates and create a more humane penal system, or are we going to be able to use this to reduce our use of the most severe sanction, which is imprisonment? In your statement, too, as you, you mentioned evidence a few times, I'd like to ask you a, a question on mm -hmm. two bits of evidence, please. One relates to um, an evaluation in, in 2000, which you, you refer to, and mm -hmm. you say 
that in the majority of cases, electronic monitoring did not displace a custodial sentence. Mm -hmm. And if I, I may, uh, one further bit of evidence you talk about, you, you go on to say, and I quote here, there must be a way to monitor and make public the number of people who get temporary release with and without a tag and track how that fluctuates in future, namely how many people are receiving uh, TR. Um, and you feel that that's relevant to the, the topic that we're, we're discussing here. Can you comment on both these, please? So the research from 2000 looked at uh, trials of community sanctions and what they, looking at the core practices, found that 60% of the, well, 40% of the people who received the alternative sanction would have likely received a prison sentence. So it means that we're not using it effectively enough to reduce prison. We're not using it effectively enough to get, use it as an alternative to divert people away from imprisonment. So that's, that's a serious issue. But if we know that, if the research reveals that, then that's something we can address with the bill that we can explicitly state that's important. We want to increase those numbers. And the, the temporary release. The temporary release. So we could, in, our, in Ireland historically, we've had low imprisonment rates. And the reason for that was because of our high use of temporary release we could easily reduce the number of people in Scotland by expanding the use of temporary release. And electronic monitoring, GPS, is an important way in which it's an avenue in which we could use that. It's an important release valve. It also allows for the kind of public protection. And those surveillance measures can support public reassurance around the issue of releasing people out of prison earlier or on and off using home leave so people leave intermittently and return to prison intermittently. But we need data to monitor and to see how those patterns change. So how will we know that the number of people receiving electronic monitoring is increasing or stabilising? We need lots of public data about that. And there's lots of criminologists and researchers and NGOs and third sector groups eager to get their hands on information like that. And we also need to monitor the number of people who are being or receiving temporary release with electronic monitoring, with GPS, as well as with community sanctions and other support measures. We have to ensure that we're not just using temporary release with electronic monitoring, therefore making temporary release more, in some ways, more punitive because it's more onerous, it's more tightly controlled. We're denying people the independence and autonomy and the trust that temporary release is meant to garner and engage between the system and the person who's been imprisoned. So we need data to be able to track how that is changing over time. So if we see that more people are using electronic monitoring or being subject to electronic monitoring, but not in actual fact, we don't see a significant increase in the number of people being released from prison temporarily. So that data is incredibly important, important to make public as well. So it's not just the Herald League Scotland, not just the government, for lots of people who are interested in these issues. OK, thank you. I have others, but I'll leave it there just now. Thank you. Daniel? Um, well, thank you. I'd just like to explore some of the points you, you, you raised. I mean, you, you said that, that the bill needs to explicitly deal with the, these things, and I, I, I hear the, the arguments you're making. Can you explain to me why the bill explicitly needs to deal with these things rather than it being a matter of policy? And, and is that, would that be simply about data, or are there other things that you'd like to see in the face of the bill to try and ensure that, that, that this is about getting more people outside of prison rather than putting additional uh, measures on the people that would otherwise already be out, as it were? It will certainly be an issue for a policy. I don't want to draw lines and say yeah. this is mainly to do with the bill. But, and I, I also get the impression that is part of the motivation behind this legislation. I know people are aware that the imprisonment rates in Scotland are high, and I know there's a real yeah. appetite right now to address that. And there's certainly public support for that. But in some ways, not wanting perhaps to create too much media headlines, I, I wouldn't want to suggest, but that that aim is slightly less explicit. It could just be more centralized and say, we want to do this, we want to reduce the imprisonment rate so we could tackle remand. So remand is not dealt with in this and we could tackle the use of temporary release and think about how many people are in prison on remand, how many people could be released on temporary release. So it might just be a matter for policy, but I think they're just getting clarity about, is this just a technological fix, or what's the ambition of making these extensions to the existing community justice system? started um, asking um, you, Dr. Lee, running the representing the Howard League, we, we'd like to hear the whole panel's view on these questions too. So please add anything to um, 
the question that, that um, if you, you have something to say on what Daniel just asked then. Nobody at this stage? Uh, yes, Liz Dugan. I actually agree with um, the, the suggestion that it might be um, helpful to consider um, remand prisoners um, for tagging yes. instead of them. For example, um, if someone appears in a summer complaint and um, has bail refused, they're remanded for a period of up to 40 days for trial. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, I, I don't have any statistics, but I think it's probably quite a lot of the remand population. Mm -hmm. And that would be ideal, I would submit, for being monitored yeah. on a tag. Because the likelihood is, even if convicted, they're not going to receive a custodial sentence. So why should they be on remand for that, um, that first period? Okay. Uh, Any I other boys? Uh, Dr Hannah? Um, so I think the aspect of the bill that r refers to um, introducing electronic monitoring with temporary release on licence um, is in response to some of the recommendations made by the Scottish Government Expert Working Group on Electronic Monitoring and their final report in 2016. And I think it's about nuancing, um, in addition to what uh, Louise has said, um, how it's being used. So if as she's pointed out, that it's increasingly used um, in a risk-averse way where uh, prisoners have uh, temporary release that would not otherwise have had electronic monitoring added to that. Um, that, that could um, potentially lead to uh, the prospect of what they call sort of backdoor or um, net widening or the potential for increased rates of recall at that end of the criminal justice system. And that that may not necessarily be widely supported, where if it is given to try and increase the amount of people who are given temporary release on licence, and for the purposes, some of the purposes that I believe are referred to in the policy memorandum with the bill, for um, supporting reintegrative uh, activities, so focusing on activities that would lead towards um, prospects of work, volunteering, education, connection with family and social relationships that would be supportive of reintegration and desistance from crime, that could potentially yield some good <laughs> results in cases that might not otherwise have been granted it. But it's down to some a need for ongoing, very skilled, individualised assessment of the person as to whether um, temporary release on licence without electronic monitoring is appropriate or if there might be some reason for that and then what technology would be used there. Leanne, you think you wanted to? Um, I just wanted to say, and I think um, uh, the Edinburgh Bar Association included this in their submissions, that I definitely see a, a, big, pros a, a big potential for using electronic monitoring to reduce the remand mm -hmm. population. Yeah. I think the committee have the statistics that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's certainly right that the, of the percentage of people who are remanded in custody, there's a very low percentage who ultimately receive a custodial sentence um, because I think the committee know that the reasons behind remand is entirely different from the sentencing considerations. Um, and I think um, I raised the issue of, of curfews, that if those were electronically monitored, I think there would be a huge potential for saving police time and ensuring compliance, um, as long as, I think that's been raised in a lot of the uh, responses to this uh, consultation, as long as it just doesn't become automatic that if you're being released in a curfew, you're electronically monitored because that's, there's, there's always a danger that if the power is available that the mm -hmm. Procurator Fiscal will ask for it and the Sheriff will say, that, yeah, that's fine. Um, the other issue that I see could, which there's real good potential for is that in domestic abuse cases, an awful lot of people appearing from custody are appearing from custody because they have breached bail conditions to go back to an address um, where their partner is, is residing. And if the GPS was able to um, widen the, the, the scope of electronic monitoring to uh, say you, you can't go to this address, then it would, I think it would deter people from breaching bail because I don't know the figures, but for, in the custody court, a, a, a large number of people are appearing from custody for breaching bail. Um, and that would, I think, ha be something that electronic monitoring could very much reduce. I just want to follow up on something that, that Dr. Hannah Graham just said. I mean, last week we had quite an interesting discussion about if this is going to be successful, 
then people with electronic tags need support around them, but that's only going to be possible if there's sufficient risk assessment uh, and, and that is provided to the right people, particularly criminal social work. But I think in the opposite uh, direction, you know, if you're going to uh, use this effectively for, for prisoners on remand or others, likewise the courts would need the information. T to what extent do you think there's a, a scope to improve this bill around risk assessment, making sure that, that both courts and criminal social work have the right information so that they know uh, both the, the requirements of the prisoner and what support they need. Do you think that, that that's an avenue that could be looked at? And I'd be interested, Dr Hannigan, but any other members of the panel, what they think about that? Indeed. So electronic monitoring as it currently exists with radio frequency technology and more often um, uh, curfews at home, um, that involves uh, risk assessment at present because they need to think about the property that is involved. Um, it, it will be interesting to see that if we move more towards uh, new technologies, the introduction of GPS electronic monitoring, there are um, instances where that could be used around exclusion zones, but it can also, um, perhaps not necessarily the best use of it, but it can, uh, um, restrictions to a place or a curfew could still be imposed. Um, I think there's, there's fairly coherent voices amongst electronic monitoring researchers that where pers a person is being restricted to a place and where that place involves other people, for example, fellow members of the household, partners, children, um, no matter what the technology, that needs to continue to involve um, individualised and also multifaceted uh, risk assessment and from having conducted research on this already in, in Scotland with the existing technology, criminal justice social workers are quite um, prominent in their conversations about that and I don't know of widespread existing concerns about the risk assessment that they use, use at the moment. Um, they're also involved in uh, risk assessments for people leaving prison on home detention curfew. So the current approach involves um, a fair degree of, of risk assessment and that information is provided to the authorising agency, be it the court, the Scottish Prison Service or the Parole Board. Um, I don't know that it's necessary that we need to look at can we get another brand new framework of risk assessment or a brand new tool, other than to emphasise that it is important and it must continue to be done well by helping professionals who are qualified to do so. We've also got a, a line of questioning on risk assessment and more um, specifically on the, the GPS. So if we could leave that just now, we will be going into it. And any supplementaries, could you make sure it's a point that you know isn't going to be raised later on? So are there any more supplementaries on that basis? Mary. I had one that was from a point a bit earlier, and it is just a brief one. It was to the to the Howard League in particular, because it was when you talked about in your uh, written submission to the committee about the electronic monitoring is unlikely to reduce the prison population and you cited a, a study which showed that only 40% of those who received a tag would in fact have received a custodial sentence. But I noticed that that study was from the year 2000. I was wondering if you had any more up-to-date statistics from that or if there is any other research ongoing. I don't have, but I can certainly seek out something and speak to colleagues about this because there were studies going on in England and Wales and in the United States, but I chose that because it was Scotland specific. Um, but one of the things, uh, so I use that to make the point, but also one of the pieces of evidence I have is in relation to a Herald League Scotland report that we released earlier this year, which was showing that the expansion of community penalties in the last 10 years has actually displaced the fine, not the prison sentence. The reason pr prison numbers have dropped moderately in the last several years, that is absolutely to be welcomed. The reason that has happened is because there are less, there's less crime. The number of people being preceded against by the courts has dropped, but the rate at which the courts are giving out prison sentences has remained steadfast. So we see expansion of the community sentence in Scotland, but we're seeing a reduction in the fine. And so that's my concern about penal expansion. And in actual fact, it's very hard to say how we know and how we can assertively direct electronic monitoring towards addressing the prison population we can do it at the point of sentence. We want to make judges more confident about the use of electronic monitoring through, you know, criminal justice social workers are saying this will be a useful intervention or a useful tactic as part of their suite of measures, but it's also as a means to tackle, we might call it back-end sentencing, so we're talking about, again, remand prisoners. 
Right now, 15% of the prison population are there who've never been convicted. And as Jan McCullen was saying, the majority of those will not go on to receive a prison sentence. Whatever, fine they've been, or whatever crime they've been convicted of has not seen to, be, to befit an imper a period of incarceration, but we have already incarcerated them. So that's incredibly serious and often the reason we use remand in that way, and I believe David Strang, the Chief Inspector of Prison, makes this point regularly and forcefully, is that we are trying to make sure and ensure people turn up to a court sentence. So the people we most regularly incarcerate who are not found guilty are the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalised and the homeless, which is why electronic monitoring and tagging can help reduce remand, but we also need to think about expanding bail services, bail support, and in that way we're reducing the prison numbers, using this new measure, but also thinking more holistically about the social supports required to prevent that diminution of our justice of using the prison sentence against people who have not been found guilty and likely will not go on to receive a sentence either. Okay, thank a you. very wide subject uh, and you know you then go on to talk about bail. We have specific questions on that. So, um, I'm very conscious, Douglas, you haven't had an opportunity to say anything. You're happy to wait to risk assessment or is there something you want to add to what we've just heard? Uh, I'm noting at this point that the, the bill which is before us relates only to disposals post-conviction. Mm -hmm. So we're, there's been a great deal of discussion about the position of remand prisoners, but the bill works on this assumption as presently drafted and presently introduced They're that the person has been convicted yeah. and that we're, it is called the Management of Offenders Bill and therefore the person is by definition an offender. So we're, we're looking perhaps at something that's not before, yeah. before the Parliament at this stage. Uh -huh. That's a fair point. Um, obviously, we're going to look and see how the bill can be improved potentially and stage two would be bringing forward um, yeah. p potentially um, amendments, because, yeah. whether that would interfere with the actual title of the bill and be, um, be uh, what's the word, legitimate? Yeah, within the scope of the bill remains to be seen. But it's an absolute fair point if you could at this stage just concentrate on um, what's in the bill. But of course, we want to hear specifically about what's not, and we have questions on that. Now, um, supplementaries, if we're going to be straying too far, then I'll, I'll cut these out. We'll just go straight to questions. If you're quite clear, Liam Kerr, and then John, you'd a small supplementary. Uh, very briefly, thank you, convener. Uh, Dr. Brangan, you mentioned studies in other countries taking place do any of you have any comment on how proposals in the bill uh, around electronic monitoring compare to approaches in other countries? What are other countries doing that, that we might copy? Um, so that is what uh, the Scottish Government Expert Working Group on Electronic Monitoring uh, commissioned myself and Gil McIver, my colleague from the University of Stirling, to do um, an 137-page Scottish and international review of the uses, and uh, we've done some more through an EU-funded comparative research study in recent years, which was the first of its kind in Europe to look at electronic monitoring in Scotland, England and Wales, Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands, but also to consider the the broader literature. So electronic monitoring is used moderately commonly in a lot of jurisdictions in Europe. Um, the European literature and practice evidence is, um, I don't want to make a generalisation, but overall tends to have more constructive outcomes or findings, whereas some of the uses of electronic monitoring in some aspects of the United States um, have perhaps more mixed results, and that could be um, quite strongly influenced by uh, approaches to criminal justice and punishment in America. Um, in terms of electronic monitoring's use within community sanctions and measures, there's plenty of other countries that use it uh, within a way, so the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and, and several others who use electronic monitoring within, for example, like a probation order. And so electronic monitoring is, is led or overseen by their national probation service. And there's some, some things that we can learn uh, in how they do that there to have the proposals here of it being added as a potential option within the community payback order. So its use within um, a probation order or a community payback order uh, is, is moderately widespread in some other countries and it hasn't led to um, particularly concerning results. So they've got quite 
high levels of order completion where there's electronic monitoring involved and moderately high levels of compliance. Um, and I can't foretell the future of what might happen in Scotland, but we could expect that where it is used proportionately within a community-based sanction and measure, people tend to comply to their electronically monitored order because it's usually co-imposed with supervision and other forms of support that help people leave uh, crime behind and address some of the issues that might contribute to that. So can I ask Dr Graham, I'm aware Douglas Thompson wants to come in, but can I ask Dr Graham just on that, is it your view then that having studied all these other countries that this bill sufficiently distills the essence of what's working in those other countries uh, such that the outcomes, the positive outcomes that you've identified will, uh, if not naturally follow, then at least be implied, uh, or is the bill lacking in some regard? Um, the part one provisions are broadly coherent with the Scottish uh, Government Expert Working Group on Electronic Monitoring who cited the international evidence quite frequently. So I'd say that there is a broad coherence with the international learnings and thankfully um, we, we have some questions around how it might be implemented in practice but it doesn't appear to be uh, mirroring some of the particularly punitive uses and lessons from the international literature, for example, in the US where some people are subject to it for a lifetime in, in very punitive and disproportionate ways. We're not seeing that reflected in the bill. So I'd say it's broadly coherent with European examples and it's also broadly coherent. I'll raise some questions and critiques about its implementation, but it's broadly coherent with the uh, Council of Europe electronic monitoring uh, recommendations or soft law rules on uh, basic thresholds of how electronic monitoring should be used in Europe. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll bow to Dr Graham's greater knowledge of, of the subject. My, my understanding from the court system is that while electronic monitoring is not rarely used, and certainly the courts will quite often when considering a custodial sentence in summary proceedings ask for a restriction of liberty order assessment, a my understanding is it's not used as much in Scotland as it could be, and it's not as used as much in Scotland as in a number of other European countries which have gripped the technology with a great deal more enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I've seen examples of courts that have imposed such orders, sometimes on people who have non-fixed addresses, which is perhaps setting them up to fail. A number of people who have been given a restriction of liberty order assessment when they're the pre-sentence report reveals details of a, a dysfunctional family setup, and that's perhaps bound to create a difficulty. But we're going perhaps into specifics there, and in the, on the general point of how it works, yeah, I think Scotland could be using it much more commonly than it is at present. And why is Scotland not using it? Is that something that requires a legislative fix, or something that requires a different approach? I suspect that some sheriffs are still a little uncertain about the technological advantages of it and some are uncertain of the extent to which it's seen as a realistic punishment. Now, I think the reality is that requiring somebody to be monitored or, and be in a certain place is, has a particularly clear benefit, but it's something that's relatively new and perhaps something that's not as well understood by sentencers as it might be. Thank you. John, supplementary. It, 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 uh, uh, it is a question about the system that they use, GPS. Now, the term increased surveillance has already been used, and there's no doubt that this um, equipment would be capable of har harvesting significant data. I wonder if the committee have concerns, uh, the witnesses have concerns about their attention or access or indeed potential use of that data, not least as, it's, as things stand at the moment in the hands of a private company. I think we we briefly addressed this in our in our submission, just in that it didn't seem entirely clear about because that's actually Jenny Gogruss. It wasn't a supplementary. We will return to that later, and um, because I know you have a lot to say on that, it's actually been allocated already. All right, but I'm doing your partner. I didn't realise. No, I, I, I realise that sometimes right, okay. it's, it's not clear. Um, Rona, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'd like to return to. Um, a line of questioning that we had a bit earlier about assessment and risks. Um, we've heard in previous evidence that, um, you know, while generally people are generally supportive of electronic monitoring, that the need for 
greater support and assessment is, is very much going to be there. In particular, I'm thinking of Dr. Marcia Scott's evidence last week, um, where she talked about um, it posing a bit of a dilemma for them because while it could obviously have benefits in, in, in monitoring perpetrators, um, the fact that a breach of a CPO doesn't automatically constitute, if, if they go on to commit an offence, doesn't constitute a breach of the CPO. Things like that. I wonder if you could talk a wee bit about just the risk and support that's going to be out there when this happens. Well, currently, when an offender is made the subject of a restriction of liberty order, there's no they, they fit the equipment and that's it. There's uh -huh. no support at all. Um, and one of the... I agree with, uh, with Douglas that the courts don't tend to use restriction of liberty orders for whatever reason. I think I think one reason is they feel that if a person's liberty should, is to be restricted, then perhaps the, the gut reaction is to send them to, to prison. Um, and there are concerns about restricting someone's liberty to a family home where there's perhaps children, there's um, difficult relationships um, and we see often even if people are just on a curfew condition without any electronic monitoring that there's a big fallout and they're thrown out the house and mm -hmm. and it it's difficult to expect a parent or a spouse or a child to have someone restricted to that address and at the moment there is absolutely when they, when they're made the subject of an order there's there's no other support mm -hmm. and they can only be restricted for up to 12 hours a day um, understandably because if you're restricting someone for up to 24 hours a day that's very very punitive mm -hmm. but if they want to offend then they can go and offend in the 12 hours a day where they're they're not restricted mm -hmm. so there's not so much of a, a rehabilitation there it, it the restriction of liberty order is very much a punitive sentence mm -hmm. um, I think designed to try and reduce the, the prison population but I'm not convinced it's had that effect at all mm -hmm. well you, you mentioned um children children and families and that was you know part of my uh, the rest of my question was you know there would surely need to be support given and counseling given to children who if if they're going to be um, if these uh, methods are going to be used more surely um, there needs to be more support Do you, would you agree with that as a panel that there needs to be more support services in place having standalone um, restriction of liberty orders, it might be better to have them ancillary to a community payback order with a supervision requirement. Um, in that case, there would be an allocated social worker for um, the person subject to the order. And um, as part of their remit, they could um, ask questions of uh, those uh, living within the home um, various pa family members about how it's, how it's actually working. Um, there, is, um, uh, there is the opportunity at present um, for uh, um, the, the monitoring services uh, of a community payback order, the, um, the local authority, to submit a review um, of a community payback order to um, the court if they believe that uh, either, for example, the order has run its course or um, it's no longer required or um, perhaps it's not working in some way that the, the person subject to the order is not um, perhaps um, getting as much out of the order as it had initially been envisaged. So that, if the restriction of liberty element was um, factored into a community payback order with a supervising officer, they can um, fulfil that role. Um, it's already in uh, the framework that's in place. Yes? I would endorse that entirely. I, I note that in our submissions, the Law Society state that electronic monitoring can never be a goal in itself but always a way to reach other goals, such as changing behaviour and protecting victims. Mm -hmm. So the monitoring is important, but it has to be part of a look at the behaviour of the offender, what caused the offending, and what can be done to manage risk in the future. Mm -hmm. So the monitoring allows the state to be clear what the offender is doing, and also, more importantly, what the offender is not doing. But as a standalone measure, it simply put somebody in a place for a number of weeks or months 
if we're not looking at the whole picture of that offender and that offender's past behaviour and future behaviour, it's not going to be of any benefit to society. And, and can you just clarify for me, please, um, in the case of domestic abuse, did I interpret Dr Scott's um, evidence correctly that if a perpetrator goes on to offend again while um, on, on a monitor, it's not constituted as a breach? It, it doesn't, you know, it's not a breach of the, the, the order if they offend again. So she's, you know, obviously there's a high, the high proportion of uh, domestic abuse uh, perpetrators do, do re-offend constantly. So that's the, the dilemma for them. Is that, is that correct? I think it's not, it's not automatic, but I would say my experience is that where somebody is a subject to an order and is accused of a fresh offence when subject to that order, it would be rare in my experience for the Crown not to take proceedings and for the court not to take some fairly condign steps in that regard. But technically, it is not, strictly speaking, an automatic requirement. Mm -hmm. But one would assume that a police force and the Procurator Fiscal Service becoming aware mm -hmm. of somebody who has breached the restriction of liberty order assessment would submit it as breach proceedings and should, it should be done with a degree of urgency in all cases. Okay, thank you. Dr Graham, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, I mean, don't feel you have don't to. Don't have to, sorry, I just thought you wanted to come in. And I, like to have I think sharp, I, yeah, um, you yeah. Know, good talk, oh. So don't think that we're <laughs> asking you to think of something. Uh -huh. Could I perhaps ask you, Douglas Thompson, I notice you say um, that electronic monitoring shouldn't extend beyond the Sheriff Court to include the GP courts. Why is that? In general terms, the, the, the Justice of the Peace Court tends not to be dealing with quite such high tariff offences. Domestic abuse, I think, is always prosecuted in the Sheriff Court, for example. A, it's relatively rare for the matters prosecuted in the Justice of the Peace Court to be the sort of matters these days that would attract a custodial sentence, and electronic monitoring is generally a, an alternative to that. It may be that practice varies from court to court, but in the court where I practice, a, it's extremely rare for any offence prosecuted in the JP court to be of a level where one would be likely to feel that the only appropriate penalty is one that requires the restriction of a person's liberty. I suppose I was thinking, um, you say in post in, in connection with a CP or a community payback order, which both sheriff and, um, and JP courts can do. So. Why would there be a difference? Would it be the level of um, offence that the CPO attracted? Or? Certainly a, a CPO as a direct alternative to custody, as opposed to a level one CPO, which is an alternative to a fine where somebody can't pay a fine. Mm -hmm. A community payback order where you're regarding as a direct alternative to a custodial sentence is imposed where the court considers that the matter is worthy of a sentence of imprisonment. Now, given the restriction on short sentences at the present time, that generally means the court is thinking of a sentence measured in terms of months. But as an alternative to that, the court will commonly impose a package of measures eh, as part of a community payback order, which may include both restriction of liberty order and supervision or unpaid or restriction of liberty and unpaid work. Now that is not in my eh, experience something that regularly eh, Come, the sort of offences that attract that level of penalty or potential level of penalty are not matters that generally come into the Justice of the Peace Court. Okay. So is it not as a standalone measure in the GP, in the GP Court you're, you're, you're saying? Or? I'm not, I don't think the society's view is that we, we would say that it should never be considered, but uh, we're simply questioning whether there is a real benefit to allowing that to be given as a potential just penalty. just me as curious, but perhaps you'd like to come back with more of a rationale if you, you, you've had more time to think about it, or after the evidence session, that's... Well, cer fine. certainly, I mean, the... Certainly, I'm not aware of uh, there being a particular pressure from the Magistrates Association, for example, to have this power. It, it may be there is, but it's not something of which the society is aware. Yeah, I was just wondering if it would help the, the offender, not if... It, um, you know, complete their sentence. I mean, that's part of the rationale, surely, of introducing the, uh, the electronic monitoring. It, it, may, it may do in some situations. I'm just thinking from my own 
uh, practice in the Justice of the Peace Court how often uh, the court that I've seen would have felt that was a, a weapon in their armoury that they would found useful. Liam McCarthy. Yeah, I just, I think if we could maybe park your earlier comment, Mr Thompson, about whether or not um, in the context of a, a bill around management of offenders it would be competent. I, I was wanting to explore whether or not the, the, the panel uh, felt that it would be beneficial to have electronic monitoring um, as a bail condition. Um, uh, if, if that were the case, um, do they feel that it needs to be explicitly then stated within, on, the, on the face of the bill? Um, and I suppose, added to that, whether or not it would solely be in the context um, where uh, remand was the, the alternative as opposed to um, applying to individuals who, who would have been uh, bailed in any event, as a, as, I suppose as a further reassurance. I definitely think that there is a real... I, I think that the two areas where electronic monitoring could really, really assist would be remand prisoners and also the area I don't know too much about, but people who are um, early released from people who are already serving a custodial sentence. And the area where I, s I have personal questions about how it, <coughs> how it would work is in conjunction with a CPO. And I don't... But that's another issue, but I don't, I'm not quite sure how in practice um, an extension of electronic monitoring would help someone complete a CPO but as far as remand is concerned then it, as 15% of the prison population are remand prisoners that would be a relatively easy way in my opinion to reduce the, the number of people who are in custody who don't really necessarily need to be there but as you say um, I would we'd have to be very careful that the Crown didn't automatically ask for someone to be mon electronically monitored in a situation where they wouldn't normally. And perhaps if someone, um, d if, if, if a sheriff is very much considering that a remand is at the forefront of his mind, there being a, a fallback to a, a curfew with electronic monitoring, because at the moment, the curfews are monitored by the police randomly attending at a house, banging on the door in the middle of the night, which that can have disruption to children, family. And it's also a waste, a waste of... I'm sure the police have got a lot better things to do. So if somebody were at the position where a curfew were appropriate and that could be electronically monitored, I see that as a real potential for, for if this bill was widened in scope. But you wouldn't see the need to express that explicitly... In the, in the bill? I think it would conditions. have to be because the, the bill doesn't cover um, remand. The bill cover, uh, covers um, electronic monitoring in conjunction with sentence and in conjunction with um, people being released from prison um, on post-conviction. Post so it would, ha it would have to be a specific um, uh, part of the bill that, uh, that addressed that, which at the moment... But I, th I think perhaps the, the government are maybe missing an opportunity here. I agree. Totally. It has to be written into the bill. It's, it's missing, and unless you write it in, you can't implement it because it, it, it will just be continued to be policed by the police service rather than um, handed over to, for example, G4S. And would you see the need to, to express it on the face of the bill with the, the, the caveats in relation to it being solely for those who otherwise would be being um, considered for remand? Yes. Right. I see noddings of heads. <laughs> I've obviously already expressed our view yeah. in that we would be in line with tonight to defer to the legal expertise on the panel, but it seems to me that it would just create a legal obligation by which we will reduce our prison population by tackling the people who have not been convicted and who are there. This, is, this marks a really exciting moment to do something productive and positive and use electronic monitoring for that purpose. And having posited the, 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 the challenge of putting a condition like that in a bill that's about the management of offenders, Mr Thompson, how, how do we get around that? It would appear to require an entirely fresh clause, uh, either, either a fresh bill or a fresh clause in this bill. I suspect, given that the, the bill is currently dealing with management of offenders, it may be that the appropriate way forward is for a, an amendment to the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act by way of perhaps of a a short one or two clause separate bill because I think given the way the bill is ma a framed and given that it's entitled Management of Offenders Scotland Bill and starts off, I mean, the, the first clause one, paragraph one starts off when disposing of a case. So mm -hmm. the assumption is that the case had been disposed of post conviction. Mm -hmm. So I think to, to take remand in would uh, require a fair bit of uh, 
mm -hmm. drafting skill, and it may be perhaps more practical to do it by way of a separate short bill. Dr Graham, you were involved in a lot of the preamble work to this. Is, is the management of offenders title of the bill uh, perhaps an, an accident or a deliberate um, uh, attempt to avoid including um, those under, un, under bail conditions? Um, I, in some ways, the Scottish Government is best uh, positioned to say whether it was accidental but or was it, intentional. Was it something that, that, you, that, that you and colleagues were, were addressing as part of the, the, the work you were doing looking at the, the use of electronic monitoring? Yes, so in electronic monitoring and in the research that we've done, everyone was quite careful to use the term monitored person. So we're not running around saying offender. Um, in conducting interviews, in doing observations, lots of people said monitored person. And more broadly in community justice, and you've already heard evidence to this effect, um, people with convictions, where a conviction has been um, uh, Im imposed. And so it's... The, the term offender is contentious in Scotland because of a Scottish Government position or commitment to not use that term um, already, and it would need to be adjusted where we're considering um, what Douglas has just spoken about, because you can't be using that language um, more broadly with people that that have uh, not been convicted. It would be I think we're going to come on to terminology in a minute, so I'll wait mm. a bit. Yeah. Just is there ever a situation where someone is up a number of charges and maybe two have been proven um, guilty and you're continuing then with other charges, would they be released on bail then? Would that cover the situation where you know bail could then be covered by the electronic monitoring? And we be within the scope of the bill, which is something we will have to, to look at as we go forward. Yeah. But I'll ask Douglas first. Where, 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 there's, where there's an outstanding trial in yeah. the same matter, somebody has, for example, yeah. pled guilty to two charges, the yeah. Crown say we still want to proceed on other charges, the court can't pass sentence in that situation until mm -hmm. the trial has concluded. So, But if they've been found guilty, could it then come within the scope of the bill and that, um, although sentence hasn't been passed, then um, they are um, deemed, but if the, you like, the, 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 the central point, the, the bill starts with from the proposition that the, the court is disposing of the case. Now, the court will not be disposing of the case until mm -hmm. guilt of all matters upon which the Crown seeks a conviction has been determined. Right. So, so I don't that think that would get around the problem. Sorry, Leanne. Um, I was going to say the same. I don't think it would, it's not something that would practically occur. Um, and if someone pleads guilty to two charges and the Crown don't accept that and want to proceed to trial on um, other charges, then there's still an untried a uh, person, whether that be a prisoner or they're still untried, so this court wouldn't be looking at sentencing. So I don't think in the scope of the bill no, it, it wouldn't sense. work. OK, thank you. Uh, Jenny. Um, good morning to the panel. Leanne McQuillan, I want to go back to something you said at the start uh, with regard to GPS provision. Um, you said it would be quite beneficial in terms of encouraging people not to visit certain areas um, whilst they were on an electronic tag. In last week's evidence session, we heard from Social Work Scotland and Community Justice Scotland, who were also pretty positive about the use of GPS. But Dr Brannigan, in your submission, um, you say that when people are... Uh, De deprived of access to large areas of public space like city centres, it sends a clear statement that they uh, do not deserve equal membership of Scottish society. And in last week's submission, we also heard from uh, Scottish Women's Aid, who were generally quite positive about the use of GPS. But they also pointed to an American study, which had been conducted with regard to victims of domestic abuse, who had felt quite anxious with the use of GPS because they could see um, the, the person who um, had perhaps attacked them and they could see their whereabouts and that had caused them stress. So I just want to ask the panel, do you think the use of GPS lends itself more so to certain crimes than others? Certainly for something like we, so Heretics are not opposed to the idea of exclusion zones and talking about something like domestic violence and that way GPS can be used in a sensible, right-minded way. Our central, and just to deal with the issue about certain crimes, well, if you have someone with, you have a criminal justice social worker who's making an assessment, then it allows for the various circumstances of each case to be deliberated over and implemented into the use of the exclusion zone rather than just doing it on a crime by crime basis. But certainly for something like domestic violence, it has clear benefits for the sense of security that someone can achieve. But our concern is about some of the enthusiasm around the idea of exclusion zo zones in the run up to the bill, which sort of suggested 
that whole city centres can be created as areas, like safe zones in which we exclude, of, we exclude offenders. And my concern there is that the idea of being a citizen in Scotland then is denigrated because you are not allowed into mainstream public space and you must stay in your zones and you must stay in your community. Certain areas, streets, avoiding certain houses, someone's workplace, again, sensible and right-minded, but the idea of citizenship, belonging and reintegration require that I think we need to be very careful about setting a very specific spatial uh, metres, kilometres, distance about the max size or number of areas that can become an exclusion zone. We have to protect the citizenship and the reintegration aims of penal policy. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the type of GPS monitoring that you mentioned that's um, technically called bilateral monitoring, so not only is um, the monitored person often an offender, but in other countries it's also used with electronically monitored restraining orders, so again we get into different parts of the criminal justice process in different language there. It has been used in the US, it's um, quite commonly used in Spain and in Portugal, and there is the opportunity for, um, if a victim gives their informed consent to carry a device or to potentially, for example, have an app that notifies them. I know that in London, the Metropolitan Police are considering the use of this with um, seeking to produce, uh, prevent stalking. So victims can have a device. In some cases, they could even consent to wearing one. Um, I don't know how common that is, or they can carry one or have a way that there's a notification that they get information. Um, the, the responses of uh, victims of crime who've t taken part in this have been mixed because they're a diverse group. Um, there, there is modest evidence to suggest that it has been moderately positive because they have been adequately briefed that electronic monitoring cannot stop someone in their tracks. It can't actually stop mm -hmm. a crime. It can give advanced notification to victims and or authorities and, and monitoring companies. So where that exists, there's been um, some cautiously optimistic victim feedback that it is helpful to know that, particularly where um, there's a moderate risk of, of harm. There have been some that could have quite legitimate concerns. For example, if um, the exclusion zone is around their house, it could be quite reasonable that a victim would think, well, I need to stay home <laughs> uh, because they'll know if they're coming near there or around their workplace or a child's school. Yeah. Um, how do we cope with more dynamic movements? So that's where the option of a victim carrying um, a device or having a way of knowing their location also comes comes in. So there can be um, concerns about its impact on them, but I would emphasise their informed consent in participating in it and their ability to withdraw at any point um, if they needed to or wanted to, because we shouldn't be imposing things on victims that, that um, have a particularly detrimental effect on them. But in Spain and Portugal um, and in the US, the studies have been... A, a, moderately optimistic that, that it can lead to some victim satisfaction, that that information is helpful in alerting them and authorities um, mm -hmm. for it to carry on. The, with the point about um, GPS exclusion zones potentially being applied to uh, entire Scottish cities, that was a news headline that caught our attention as well, and the principle of proportionality would be really important. But also, if there was a reason for a sentencer to impose an exclusion zone around an entire city in Scotland, um, that would raise the question as to why such a, a large ranging um, exclusion zone has been imposed that's not being tailored and what could be done, what supports could be put in place as well as um, surveillance or perhaps controls to make sure that we're not displacing the issues that they're actually seeking to address. So if someone is not allowed in that entire city and they go elsewhere, if, if there's such a concern about that, we need to think also about displacement and are they taking behaviours and propensities with them that could happen elsewhere. So I, I would caution against restricting people away from entire cities. Rather, exclusion zones are usually used around where there has been a strong propensity to offend or very tailored uses that need to keep someone away from that for a period of time. I think um, I, when I talk about the potential use for electronic monitoring, keep, keeping people away from a place, I'm referring to a house um, where they have been asked to leave because there's been domestic violence. They've had mm -hmm. to provide an alternative address and it would um, 
give the, the um, complainer some, um, because at the moment it's just a bail condition and people can breach it, but if it was electronically monitored, it might give, it might deter the, the uh, person on bail and it might also give a little bit of comfort to the complainer. As far as exclusion zones are concerned, I, the court in Edinburgh quite often, well, not rarely, um, get grant people bail with special conditions that they do not enter the city centre exclusion zone. There's mm -hmm. an actual exclusion zone and they get a map and it's drawn in red and they're not allowed to go into that, that area. And it's some sheriffs don't like it, but it, it does get imposed. And it mean, it's usually for people who are maybe shoplifting or going out in the, in the middle of the night to city centre bars and causing trouble. But as, as uh, Dr. Brannan says, it, it moves the people away. To, if they're going to offend, I'm quite happy, sure they can find somewhere to offend elsewhere. Yeah. Um, also, bail conditions in respect of not to enter Edinburgh. I've seen bail conditions that the person does not enter Scotland, usually when they come from somewhere out with Scotland. Um, and it, these conditions can be imposed for months and months and months. And I would be concerned about those those bail conditions in themselves are dubious, but um, I would certainly be concerned about that being extended to electronic monitoring. Jenny? Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you for that. There's, there's obviously limitations in terms of the use of this technology. And we heard last week with regard to the use of GPS in rural areas, particularly in terms of, of reception and, and being able to, to use it effectively. Um, but one of the other limitations, um, Dr Brannigan, that you, you highlight in your submission is the use of GDPR legislation and how does that interact um, with data protection and GPS monitoring. And you say that with GDPR reframing future organisational behaviour around privacy, what are the precise data protection implications of expanded electronic monitoring, including GPS? And I'd really be interested to hear the rest of the panel's views with regard to how those two uh, areas interact. Well, we just wanted to raise the question because there's no organisation right now that isn't sort of in yeah. a frightful state of GDPR, GDPR yeah. anxiety mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. I, everywhere I go for meetings, I hear other meetings of people saying, mm -hmm. have you had your advisor in yet? And what are we going to do? And that made me think really like this is some of the most personal, intimate data about a person and also with the transdermal alcohol monitoring. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted, I don't want to sort of naturally cast an air of suspicion over it, but I think those thinking in those new parameters of data protection, who has the data? How long will they have it? Um, and who else will have access to it? Will there be data sharing across the criminal justice system? Is that right and appropriate? I'm not suggesting we necessarily have all of the answers to that right now, but that really should be at the forefront of our thinking if we want to expand this technology, is trying to keep it in line with the basic rights about data protection and thinking about the vulnerable people and the detail of data we're going to be gathering from people mm -hmm. with this if we do extend it. And I would also um, note the Information Commissioner's Office um, written evidence submission to the committee. And uh, in, the, in the past, during some of the consultation activities, the Information Commissioner's Office has um, made statements to the effect of being very mindful of the privacy uh, principles and privacy legislation, and also the keeping an eye on the potential uses of GPS electronic monitoring that have occurred in other jurisdictions. Um, because in, for example, in England and Wales, there have been examples where electronic monitoring is used on a voluntary basis um, by people who are not, who have perhaps pr prolific offence histories, but are not currently subject to a sanction. And that was police force led uh, uses of electronic monitoring, and it was not regulated in the sense of we're not, um, the research has been able to show perhaps some uses of how that information was used, but police forces also have law enforcement, criminal investigation activities, and there's been suggestions that in some places in other countries, um, GPS electronic monitoring data could um, be of keen interest and features in the European ethical standards as a, as a caution that privacy needs to be upheld and we need to question quite robustly um, the potential use of the electronic monitoring GPS data, not only for monitoring, but for, oh, a crime has been committed, should we open a map and uh, see who was there? Because 
yeah, there's some fairly strong um, considerations there that the Information Commissioner's Office has, has warned against. And I believe that their term uh, was to warn against uh, phishing exercises in the sense of at the moment, the Scottish Government owns electronic monitoring data and so they would be the, uh, the data controller. Mm -hmm. And so requests need to go to them. And this is not this is not to cast doubt on whether police should have some access or reasonable access to the information, but my understanding is that at the moment they would need to know the sort of who, what, a broad parameter of what they're looking for mm -hmm. rather than in other jurisdictions where it might have been open up a map and see who was about. Um, not to mention that some people would say, well, I can prove that I wasn't there and you can check. Um, but there are some privacy concerns about how the privacy legislation would fit if it was used for purposes other than monitoring. Um, so I think we've, we've encouraged the Scottish Government to continue to be the owner of the data or the data controller so that um, access to it is subject to vetting or to checks mm -hmm. and to a decision-making process. I, I suspect slightly different considerations might apply where someone is accused of and disputes breaching a restriction of liberty order assessment or similar, and that matter goes before the court, because the, the question of who retains the data and for what period of time will be different, because there may in the future be circumstances in which the precise circumstances of that breach will become controversial. So it's not as, as straightforward when the data is, going, is being used in connection with an alleged breach. I'm not saying I have the answer, but it's something that has to be considered. Yeah. Um, Jenny Ruth mentioned the rural aspect. I wondered, Liz, if you wanted to, to contact, uh, 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 to comment on that, given you, your practice is at Dumfries and Gallery. Um, well, um, we don't actually keep any records ourselves about who is subject to a, um, a restriction of liberty order or um, monitoring electronically. Um, but I did contact um, G4S. I spoke to the research and development officer and she has produced some um, statistics for um, the period from April 2017 until April 2018 on a month-to-month -month basis for the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. So if you take Dumfries and Galloway as a, perhaps a typical rural area, I don't think I have copies for everybody, but um, uh, there's maybe enough for one between two. Mm, we'll distribute them, so don't worry yeah. about that um, afterwards. Um, but um, it's not a really high uptake. Um, I think um, there needs to be a bit of education with regard to um, the sheriffs um, to encourage them that this is an option. There needs to be more um, education of um, social workers um, that uh, when, when they're doing a report for sentence, they consider electronic monitoring as an option as well. Um, probably also um, more education of uh, defence solicitors, I think, um, that we should be asking for that um, at the point of adjournment for sentence. Um, because you, you often find in our area if... Um, if the sheriff doesn't specifically see uh, criminal justice social work reports and a restriction of liberty order assessment, the report will come back and it will be silent on the element of restriction of liberty. Um, so, but um, for the month of April 2018, we only had uh, four persons being electronically monitored in the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, on that rural aspect, was you, Liam and Andrew? Yeah, I just wondered whether um, uh, the assumption that um, our reticence about using it in maybe remoter rural areas is, is always a reflection of the, the, the technology reach or whether it's in, in part a reflection of where there is found to be a, a, a breach, the potential response times may take longer and therefore the risk assessment of, of, of its operation is a different calculation than it might be in, in more urban areas. That may be correct. Um, the officer from G4S who I spoke to um, advised that um, they don't actually have any permanent staff based in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, for fitting of the equipment, they send someone from Glasgow or Edinburgh. Um, from Glasgow, it takes about an hour and a half to get to Dumfries, and from Edinburgh, sometimes depending on traffic, it will be up to about two and a half hours. 
Um, so the same applies for any alleged breach. Um, they did, however, indicate that they've had no difficulties installing equipment anywhere, uh, even in the most um, rural areas. Um, the, uh, if there isn't a, currently it, it, it works on radio waves, I think. Mm -hmm. If there isn't a, a telephone system, they just contact BT and they will, they will um, connect a telephone system. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they advise that they've had no difficulties um, installing the equipment and monitoring it. It's just that they don't have a lot. <laughs> I, think the, I think the government officials were saying that the, the, the contract would be up for um, renewal in due course and that actually the difficulty in establishing the, the, the likely costs and usage um, is, is partly a reflection of that. Would, from, from what you've established in Dumfries and Galloway, would it be your expectation that any new contract needs to not simply operate from a Glasgow or Edinburgh base for, for the very reasons you've identified in terms of distance to to get to places like Dumfries and Galloway uh -huh. as the member for, for, for Orkney, I'd, I'd, I'd suggest that the, the time differences may be even greater. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose when the, the contract is being put out for tender, um, it, it would have to be explained that they're expected, there are expected to be an uptake in these type of orders and um, they will require to have a permanent base in, in the more rural areas for the purpose of, or at least someone stationed there for the majority of the time uh, for installation and um, monitoring purposes. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Dr. Hannah, you could lead on that once, John. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I don't know whether to be extremely concerned, a bit concerned at the, at the ease with which you acquired information from G4S, because uh, I would have thought, um, you know, that information shouldn't readily be available over the phone, and this isn't to cast any d doubt in yourself. It's um, they publish um, <coughs> statistics. They don't have names, obviously, but they publish the statistics on. Um, uh, an annual basis, and uh, these ones will go into the new report um, for the next year. And there's um, uh, there's a statistical bulletin currently, the most up to date published one, for, uh, runs from the 1st of January 2016 to the 31st of December 2016, and that's readily available on um, their website. Um, you can look it up and print it off, and um, it, has, um, it has a section with orders received um, during that period on a geographical area. Um, again, I've got a copy of that. Uh, I've only got one copy. Yeah. Told, um, we'd be very grateful to receive it. could be handed into the class. Um, it, it says that the, the highest uptake is um, from Glasgow, understandably. Um, they have... Uh, uh, 467 um, for uh, the year from the 1st of January 2016 to the 31st of December 2016. The next highest is interestingly Kilmarnock um, with 244. Um, Dumfries comes in at 32, but the, the um, details Stranraer separately with 11. So if you total the two, it's... Um, 30, uh, 43 for the whole of Dumfries and Galloway for the, um, the year. Okay, thank you. Well, well, well I don't doubt we'll, we'll pick up on these statistics, and that's reassuring that's, that, that they are available like that. I just wonder if the panel had concerns about a private company retaining data. There, there's a lot of public, understandable public concern about data and the potential use it could be put to. I hear what uh, Dr. Graham said about the Scottish Government, but it does seem entirely out of kilter to have the legal profession, all these uh, statutory bodies, and I would have thought criminal justice social work would have led in this rather than a, a commercial concern. I suppose it depends what, what, at the moment, they're only holding uh, data in relation to someone who's just generally restricted to their house, um, and I, I guess it becomes... Sorry, I was meaning more with the GPS and the yeah, additional information yes. that would come with that. Um, and with, with that coming in, it really depends what statistics they're, they're, they're holding. If they could be holding very... If it goes on to use of alcohol use and drug use, a, a private company holding that sort of details about a person, I think, would be very, very concerning. 
and there would have to be some robust measures in place to ensure that that, that was dealt with properly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, um, it touches on broader um, discussions that are worth having about whether we want um, the privatised model that's currently in place in Scotland, has been in place in England and Wales, um, or whether to look at other approaches, and that's a much bigger question than the bill that that is uh, before us and electronic monitoring has been done with um, moderate success and proportionality in places like the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Denmark and elsewhere and those are public service led. Um, so my understanding with the only involvement of the private sector might be to sell or procure the, the product itself but after that it is public service led um, almost in its fullness and probation service led so our equivalent of criminal justice social work so there are some really good questions to be asked in this regard okay thank you very much can i perhaps ask about compliance and enforcement um i, I think there's a general feeling if uh, electronic monitoring is to be successful then um it, breaches have to be handled effectively could I have your view on that if the, the, the bill is clear enough to what the consequences of breach would be? And clearly there's a balance to be had between um, desistance and supporting desistance and um, for the offender and a robust response which can help reassure the victim. Who'd like to take that one? Dr Hannah, it looks like you. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there is a a balance to be struck between what can be achieved in the bill and then leaving some of the decision-making to sentences as to how much we uh, confine or tell them how to decision-make and have some parameters around that. There's also differences between uh, what constitutes a breach and what constitutes things that are considered violations and come to the notice of the authorising agencies but may not mean a breach of the order. Um, and so currently with uh, restriction of liberty orders, with home detention curfews, those are the two most commonly electronically monitored orders in Scotland at the moment. We've got moderately high completion rates, order completion rates, so that means we're not seeing drastic amounts of breach, recall, revocation. Um, that does not mean that there hasn't been violations along the way, i.e. Um, being late to being home and getting phone calls about that and those um, different or a, a strap tamper alert uh, where they have possibly um, um, touch or sought to remove the device in a way that the device can then tell the monitoring organisation. So it's about calibrating your expectations around what would happen in the event of breach. At the moment, electronic monitoring can be imposed as a restricted movement requirement if someone um, is, in, uh, is it in, in breach of a CPO or looking to be, they're certainly non-compliant of a CPO and looking to move it towards um, an option within the community payback order, I'd suggest that that's where complementing it with supervision or a supervising officer and the ability to inform breach decision making is very, very useful because um, arbitrary decisions about technology, um, considering the human circumstances around it, I wouldn't want to see um, order completion rates significantly falling and uh, breach and revocation rates rising because that could lead to um, certainly more people before the courts if not more people being potentially returned to prison depending on the modality in which it's used. So the conversation needs needs to be had but there is variation with decision makers across the country. Some will act in a certain way and others will leave the notifications for a while and just be knowledgeable of them but not say that this is a breach of the order. So th there's a balance to be struck in, the, in what the bill can achieve and then how decision makers, for example, sentences actually implement it because they're not, not always favourable to too much incursion on their decision making and their professional discretion. So I'd, I'd defer to those who, sp who spend more time in the courts. but. Uh, breach decision making is still just that, a decision on an individualised basis. I suppose I'm turning it around the other way. Do you think it's um, important that it is dealt with effectively? Would electronic monitoring um, 
not work so well if, if, if it was seen that the breaches weren't fit and dealt with it effectively. Um, Douglas, you wanted to... to yes, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Clause 14 in particular, noting that uh, it's presumed in the bill that evidence will be given by way of a document containing certain information yeah. and that the document is in effect self-proving, although it can be challenged obviously by the offender, but the document itself would be the evidence of the breach. Now, in our past life, uh, when I was a member of the Parole Board for Scotland, uh, when uh, electronic monitoring of offenders came in as, as part of the release conditions, we became aware very quickly that the quality of information being given to the panel considering breaches of electronic monitoring was not of a uniformly high standard. And the concern here is that when we're concerned in the bill with evidence to be given in the form of a statement, a statement is only as good as the information input into that statement. And there are potential concerns, particularly where somebody is saying, I did not commit that breach, or there is an explanation for this which is not seen in the, on the face of the document itself. There would have to be some form of hearing built into the system, and that's going to go back to the courts. And certainly my, my recollection was that uh, the quality of information did improve after a period of time, but. Uh, it does take a bit of work for people to learn how to produce information, which is, after all, important in the sense that the breach of an order will commonly result in somebody going into prison. Okay. Uh, Liam? I think it's also important of actually how quickly the breach is dealt with, because at the moment, a restriction of liberty order, it's, it's as... Um, Dr. Graham said it's, it's, if it's only imposed as standalone, although you can impose it with a CPO, but they don't necessarily marry together very well. But it's G4S are monitoring any inf infr infringements of the order. And I generally, I think if someone's five minutes late home, they might get a phone call from G4S saying, where have you been? But and if, if there's a lot of small infringements, then G4S will take the decision to send a report back to the Sheriff Clark's office to have the order returned to the court, or if the person just disappears or takes the equipment off, that will be done more quickly. But it still has to go through the Sheriff Clark's office. It still has to be processed. Um, and a very recent experience of a client of mine who has multiple issues, he was made subject of a restriction of liberty order at a temporary accommodation. To quote the temporary accommodation, he broke every rule in the accommodation and he had to be asked to leave. Um, he told a support worker, I'm no longer there, but she's nothing to do with the court system. So the equipment has, had, I think, has lay for weeks in this address where he had gone to stay somewhere else. And if it could be more effectively dealt with, that equipment could have simply been moved. Um, and that was about three months ago and it's only now come to court. So that that sort of thing isn't really going to um, be very effective. And I think some sort of judgment on a breach as well that's not just G4S making that decision, but perhaps someone who is more aware of the, the uh, person's particular circumstances uh, would be helpful. Well, Maurice. Thank you, Marina. Um, you, you, following on from your points earlier on about the, the, the electronic monitoring is part of the solution, how do you feel the bill provides, in the case of sufficient directions, in terms of how electronic monitoring should be used in practice, particularly in tandem with other measures, and bearing in mind your comments earlier on? It's really very much an issue for sentencers, and I think I, in our submissions we draw attention to the fact that a lot of that will be a matter of more for the Judicial Institute for Scotland than for the bill itself. The bill by its very nature, is creating something that will operate across the whole country and will operate in sentencing in all fora that it, in which it is competent to do that. The question of how that operates in practice is a matter for individual sentencers dealing with individual cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we have created uh, the Judicial Institute, and that's why there is a degree of training for sentencers in this field, because we're looking to increase the use of electronic monitoring. Now, mm -hmm. courts have to be aware that there is a genuine and useful purpose for this and that the idea behind it is that it will protect the public more and it will reduce the risk of reoffending. It's not really for the, the law society to direct sentencers on when and how they should use that, mm -hmm. but uh, we're aware that uh, the Judicial Institute will be a engaging in the future, once the bill becomes an act, right. uh, the Judicial Institute will engage and they will issue <coughs> guidance to sentencers. 
But as it stands at the moment, I mean, do you feel that the, such matters we discussed just now should be set out more clearly in the bill uh, and in, or in, also in the statutory guidance along with it? I think the terms of the bill, uh, the, the, the relative, the clause one in particular, which starts off the monitoring pr process, is clear enough to be understood by anybody sentencing, and it's simply a matter of uh, how it's used in practice. But I don't see there's anything in the terms of the bill that would be a difficulty to the law society. Right. Well, yeah, that's fine for the law society, but, but to, to, to the sheriffs and, uh, and understanding how it's implemented. Implementation is really a matter for the the individual sentencer. Yeah. I don't think there's anything within the terms of the bill that would create difficulties for a sentencer. Right. Okay. Thank you. I want to turn to part two of the bill around disclosure of convictions. I have a number of questions around that. First of all, uh, from a, a practical perspective, and I note in your evidence, uh, Leanne and Douglas, that you, you point to the, the nature of this will make it easier for everyone to understand lay persons and, and those involved in the system. Perhaps you'd, you'd like to elaborate on that first. And Douglas, I notice you're nodding your head. Well, the, the 1974 Act that's to be uh, replaced or amended by this isn't the easiest piece of legislation to navigate your way around. And uh, we're saying that the bill, as presently drafted, is a, a considerable improvement. Uh, we have some observations about the, the way the bill deals with road traffic matters, but as a, as a general point in the round, it's going to create a greater degree of clarity, albeit that we did feel and do feel that perhaps a glossary of terms uh, could be added in, in in a schedule to the ultimate act so that people are aware. I mean, we've drawn attention in our paper to the fact that a great many people don't understand the difference between ab admonition and absolute discharge and what the implications of them are. They are, while no penalty is opposed in either case, they have different consequences. And perhaps making clear uh, in road traffic matters what the different positions regarding endorsement disqualification. Terminology is not always understood by those who would be looking at uh, this and trying to work out how the bill would affect them in, in the future. So really, it's important that the public understand what the new measures are. And because they're dealing with a wide range of sentences, we've covered already this morning a, a considerable amount of different forms of sentencing orders. The public need to know exactly where they fit into that and where it goes into the bill. Now, it's, it is a slightly easier exercise, but it's still not an easy exercise to go through the new bill and see how it all works in practice. Thank you for that constructive suggestion. Leanne, you've seen your evidence about clients finding the current legislation difficult to, to understand. Do you think this will be a, an improvement as, as drafted in the bill at the moment? I, th I think it's a huge improvement because I actually understood it and I don't understand the 1974 legislation. So um, clients often, although it's not really part of our day-to-day -day job, often say, when will my conviction come, become spent? And then you, you, have, you can't just give them an easy answer. You have to look it up. And I do think it would its clarity is very, very much welcomed. Um, the only thing, my only concern looking at it again yesterday is in relation to admonition and absolute discharge, uh, not as far as the terminology is concerned, but um, is as far as the proposal that there be uh, no uh, disclosure period for an absolute discharge and an admonition um, is concerned because um, routinely people are admonished for what the public would think would be quite serious offences, assaults involving injury, usually after perhaps a period of good behaviour or if, if there's particular circumstances that the sheriffs became aware of. And that, that's, I'm sure they're, they're all, all for very good reasons. But if you look at that against the, the fact that in a road traffic case, if you're driving, if you're speeding or driving without insurance, you, will, you would never get admonished. You would always get a financial penalty. And it may be that some employers might be less concerned about someone who has once driven without insurance than someone who has perhaps um, assaulted someone in, in a bar or been involved in offences of dishonesty but received an admonition. So um, I think there's certainly... The, the fact of a road traffic conviction, if, the, if there was some clarity that if, if the disclosure certificate showed that they were fined a certain amount of money, but made it clear it was a road traffic matter, and I'm not necessarily convinced that an admonition should automatically 
be put in the same category as an absolute discharge. An absolute discharge is exceptional, and I would totally agree with the, the proposal that there be no uh, disclosure period for that, but an admonition I'm not so sure about. Thank you for that, and I'll come back to terminology in the 1974 Act shortly. First, before that, I want to talk about uh, attitudes to, to previous convictions. and. One of the, the the bill seeks to reduce the length of time most convictions will take before being treated as spent, and uh, to extend the length of custodial sentences covered by the provisions. And the question we're asking ourselves as we evaluate this legislation, of course, is do the proposals achieve an appropriate balance in these respects? And uh, Dr. Louise Brannigan, I know you, in your submission you've made some. Uh, comments around the, that the amendments will still allow for disclosure of spent convictions and that this bill will allows the continued demand for lifelong disclosure and you had some, some concerns about that perhaps you'd like to. So we also welcome the reduction in disclosure periods because why wouldn't that, why wouldn't we welcome that? But our concerns are that there are still, so it increases from I think 36 months to 48 months, the period of which you will have lifelong disclosure. And working with people who have, are serving long-term and life sentences, they can conduct themselves as model prisoners, take up all the education and opportunities. But inevitably, they know, and will say this, that when they get released on parole, that the stigma that they experience of being a prisoner, the stigma and the shame they'll offend of having committed a serious crime, will be stuck to them forever. And right now, we have a prison system, SPS under Colin McConnell, that is more interested than ever in developing desistance-led, rehabilitative, transformative penal policies. And we have people in prison for longer than ever before in Scotland, and we still don't seem to trust those measures. We still require people to be held at arm's length to be denied the reintegrative processes that SPS policies promise them that they can have, civic repair, re-engagement, becoming part of society. So the 48 month or over lifelong disclosure just seems unnecessarily punitive, particularly when we know the evidence, particularly come from the SECJR recently, again, emphasizing that when a period of seven to 10 years, someone's rate or chance of re-offending is equal to someone who has never offended. So the evidence supports allowing someone to have a spent conviction. It supports the idea of social justice. It supports the idea of reintegration. And if someone is always having to disclose application to a university, application to any new job. You already have a gap on your CV, and I just think we are shoring up the stigma. We are blocking people from re-entering society as full citizens in the way in which we say they can after they've served their time. So you would argue that the bill uh, doesn't quite do enough in terms of changing attitudes to the employment of people with convictions? No, because it permits, it permits people to be stigmatised against... A, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't do anything to address the sort of the ban, the box. It allows employers are still allowed to ask for someone if they have a criminal conviction. Often, if you go to apply for a university course, it will ask if you have a criminal conviction. I was just at a prison education conference recently, speaking and listening to a young man who applied to do an architecture course, having done brilliantly at everything else when he applied to this elite university and got in, and they found out he had a criminal conviction from when he was 18. They, they rescinded his place. We should be penalising employers and universities from acting as extensions of the justice system for keeping people out of society. Maybe not penalising because I'm for penal parsimony, but certainly creating a set, a framework of legislation about what is and isn't acceptable. So it's not just about reducing the period of which someone has to disclose their conviction, but also reducing an employer's reach into someone's background. So, so some work in terms of changing uh, recruitment practices. Um, I, I note that Dr. Anna Graham, you've also touched on this in, in your evidence and say that uh, you're of the view that the proposed reforms are to be welcomed, but they are limited in scope. I don't know if you want to, to add anything to what Dr. Brannigan has said. Indeed. Um, so uh, this particular part of our submission was primarily authored by Dr. Beth Weaver from the University of Strathclyde, uh, my co-author and fellow researcher in the SCCJR. And she's recently conducted um, a moderately detailed review about the issues surrounding disclosure, um, employment and uh, desistance from crime and considering time to redemption studies. And I think she's come up with, um, and I agree with, the, a number of suggestions um, that could be advanced and that other countries have advanced um, to try and encourage that balance between um, the information needed 
needing to be known for um, potential public protection reasons and for employers wanting to know for particular occupations compared to the fact that, what was it, 38% of men in Scotland and 9% of women have at least one criminal conviction and we're not talking about necessarily particularly small small groups here. So um, we, we support what's, we're broadly supportive of what's in part two of the bill but would encourage that um, perhaps, and this is tricky because elements of this more broadly are reserved or not devolved and not everything can be achieved through legislation either, but a piecemeal approach to consideration of disclosure and its collateral consequences isn't as helpful as a more sustained overarching um, who should disclose what and when. And so um, Beth has a number of suggestions if you'd like me to explain those now. I don't know if they're the subject of another person's question. Um, I think we'll leave things just now, but yeah. perhaps yep. you could uh, submit them. And, uh, yes, that would be helpful. Just quickly as well, um, particularly, uh, uh, and Dr Brannigan, you, you, you mentioned an 18-year-old, but do you, do you think as drafted the current balance in the bill will help uh, assist children to move on from previous offending behaviour, but uh, from both the right. It, it certainly, it certainly does in that respect. But I also think we should protect adults if you're 20 years away from even having committed a homicide. At what point? And you've the 20 years, and you've served 10 years in prison. Perhaps actually the chances are much longer. The question in the bill says, do we allow people to move on? And I would wonder when are we willing to let go? When are we willing to forgive? When are we willing even just to tolerate? So yes, it helps young people, but we should not write adults off either. Thank you. And, and just as I said, keen to ask about terminology in the 1974 Act as well. So at present, the drafting of this legislation is to amend uh, and build on parts of the 1974 Act. But concerns were ra raised with us in our last evidence session last week around the use of terminology within that Act, particularly around offender and ex-offender. Um, do you think that the 1974 Act should be, would it be desirable and or practical to replace the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 or as, or as the bill set out sufficient? be interested in that. I think it would be desirable, confused. but whether it would be practical or not, it's, it's certainly a very difficult piece of legislation to understand and perhaps does use terminology that in 1974 was more acceptable than now. Any other thoughts on that point around that terminology and, and the 74 Act? I, I think the points have been well made to you in previous evidence sessions around um, the overall uh, resistance to the word offender, particularly with a bill that deals with uh, disclosure, which will relate to people that are um, entering the labour market, accessing education, and um, we, we have to consider at what point do we stop calling them um, an offender if that's not an accurate... Um, uh, point now. Yeah. So can I okay. bring Liam, Thank you, Liam Karen? Thank you, convener. I, I'd just like to stay with uh, Ben McPherson's line talking about the disclosure period. Uh, Dr Brangan, you said why wouldn't we welcome that in relation to the reduction of disclosure periods? And just sitting listening, presumably the answer is if you were an employer who was concerned about your employee, uh, or perhaps public safety. Uh, so I think it poses a, a more base question about what is the purpose of a disclosure period? What interests and whose are we trying to protect here? I wonder if any of you have any comments on that. Dr Graham. What is the purpose of disclosure? What, yeah. what is the purpose of a disclosure period? Indeed, okay. Um, well, Overall, there are multiple purposes around disclosure and having a period where it has to be disclosed and that buffer, I think the government have referred to it as a buffer period of time after the sentence is finished. So some of the reasons are uh, minimising the risk of liability and loss. Um, as you mentioned, concerns surrounding public protection where the nature of employment involves working with particular groups. Um, it could have to do with assessments of moral character in terms of honesty or trustworthiness. 
um, and compliance, so statutory occupational requirements. Those are some of the reasons for the, there being um, regulations surrounding disclosure periods, but there's also provisions to guide or limit practices of disclosure to reduce unnecessary barriers to people with convictions accessing employment. So, uh, yeah, disclosure periods are there for multiple purposes, and it depends on from whose perspective which purpose would be most um, important. Um, the person with convictions, the employer, um, the government, and others. I imagine you get some quite nuanced responses there. So if that's the purpose behind having a disclosure period, are you able to point to any research <coughs> which says that the length of time proposed as the disclosure period uh, sufficiently uh, relates to the crime and the propensity to, to minimise public, maximise public protection or uh, to ensure rehabilitation? Um, so Beth has done a review of um, time for redemption studies and those look empirically at um, the amount of time that it might take for a person with convictions um, to basically resemble the same um, as be considered as opposing the same amount of risk as people with no convictions. It's done on conviction and not offending because it's entirely possible there's offending that doesn't get caught um, and also uh, that there's cautions against the risk of a non-convicted person not having um, a baseline level of zero in terms of probability of offending. So the, the research has shown that in general an average of seven to ten years without a new arrest or conviction, a person's criminal record essentially loses its predictive value. And that is overarching in studies that have been done across a national cohort as well as studies that have been done with just a city. Um, and so that means that after seven to ten years, even irrespective of crime type, there are a few subtleties that, for example, um, people who have been convicted of violent crimes it might take slightly longer um, for their criminal record to lose its predictive value. But overall, after seven to ten years, the, um, the risk of reconviction is essentially not particularly different between convicted and non-convicted people. Uh, do you want to say something, Mr Thompson? Or? No, OK. Um, it, so uh, you're comfortable then that the proposed disclosure periods are sufficiently plotted against what the evidence said would be a appropriate? Is that what I can take from this? Um, by and large, but supporting um, uh, Dr. Brennan's submissions, it could go further. Um, and we could consider why um, disclosure periods, at which point something can then have the chance of becoming a spent conviction, why that isn't being extended beyond um, into those who serve long-term sentences. Because in terms of European research and European uh, practices, it's not necessarily widespread that this applies. It's more unique to, to the UK and elsewhere. They're not routinely doing employer checks of um, uh, criminal records and background checks necessarily as a norm. That's interesting. Could you just elaborate on that? Forgive me, convener. Um, I think what you just said was that uh, what we are doing in regards to disclosure as a principle is unusual uh, in relation to the European angle. Is that correct? Aspects of the European angle. Europe uh, is a big place. So one of the options that's moderately common in a number of countries, and I can list them, is the option of expungement of criminal records. So that means not revealing spent con convictions. And through the European Convention of Human Rights and the European, I believe, challenges in the European Court of Human Rights, um, there have been questions raised about uh, the bill at, as it currently stands relates to basic disclosure, but there have been questions raised why in, in standard and enhanced and in other uh, forms of disclosure checking that um, information can still come up about spent and un unspent convictions. So expungement of criminal records, um, not revealing spent convictions, Convictions is quite true for Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Luxembourg, Spain, and a longer list. And so, um, yeah, that, that's moderately common practice. And if you wish for uh, more detailed information, on, I could ask uh, Beth to correspond. Specifically on this, oh, so if there's 
Uh, is there any other angle, Ben? I, I have one more uh, line to explore, which is just simply that uh, Leanne McQuillan earlier on made a distinction between uh, different crimes. Uh, and I wonder, is, is this something of a blunt instrument disclosure? Just saying a disclosure period for uh, all crimes that attract a certain sentence might last for this long. And what I have in my mind is that, let's say, a, a, an assault might never reoccur because it might be a one-off, uh, the individual uh, matures, something like that. They're, they're not going to, to do it. But a sophisticated financial fraud, uh, might, there might be a greater propensity to, to recommit that. And if I'm the employer, I might want to know about the sophisticated financial fraud much more than I do about the assault. Is that a fair uh, distinction to make? Indeed. So are you saying that there are some types of um, disclosure, disclosure information about crime type that would be more relevant to particular types of occupations, or are you saying uh, employers in general? Perhaps. I, I guess I'm suggesting that uh, by having a kind of blanket disclosure policy, uh, after X time, you do not need to disclose. Uh, actually, if there is a distinction between crimes, the, the type of people who are committing them and the, the state of their ability to do so, I, as the employer, might have a greater interest in knowing about it regardless of the length of time that's passed. Indeed, but if we bring up the question of their ability to do so in reoffending, there might be some very um, complex and difficult conversations to be had because um, relevance to the occupational role of disclosure and propensity to uh, reoffend or be reconvicted are, are separate considerations based on crime type. Um, for example, uh, shoplifting might have moderate or high uh, reconviction and other types of crimes such as sexual violence might have moderate or low uh, risk of reconviction. So I wouldn't go, uh, I'd urge caution about moving towards it being about risk of uh, reconviction because there might be some very difficult uh, public conversations to be had there. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, Convener. And yeah, I wonder if I could just return um, briefly to um, something we touched on with Dr Graham, and that's the higher level disclosure checks. I'd quite like to know your, the panel's views generally, as briefly as you can, please, just on whether you think they, this is good, that they're not in included in the bill, or and at some point should this be revisited and, and, and perhaps reformed? <coughs> Who'd like to answer like that? To? Any view? So, Herald League Scotland, we would absolutely recommend that the higher level disclosures need to be addressed. We could amend, if we, if we think about the disclosure periods that we're addressing today, that's welcome, but we, we look at it broadly and see that it's a two-tier system, that in actual fact for certain jobs, is for certain positions, which is constantly expanding as a list, doesn't matter, and also that you have a spend conviction, that is a real... It doesn't matter that you have a, an arrest, that you weren't, no, no conviction arose from, that can be revealed or a caution. So actually that is very serious. And I think if we're thinking about a system based on reintegration and about encouraging people into employment, people into education and to create a healthier Scotland than actually demanding that people always disclose their conviction no matter the length of period or no matter the length of period between whatever the transgression was, even if it was a conviction, that will have to be addressed at some point and it slightly undermines some of the better ambition of part two of the bill. Okay, anyone else? Yep. No. With that, okay. good. George. Thank you. Good morning. I would just like to ask uh, Following on from what we've been discussing there is the fact that we as internet access to past convictions. Now, we all know we live in an age where local newspapers will camp outside the sheriff court and will report on these stories, as is their right. But if you compare it to the early 90s, where something would have happened, you'd have had to have gone to the library to find out previous information. Now you can just go into an internet search engine as an employer and possibly just check the person and see if anything's there. Now, how do we deal with that moving forward is the question I would ask. And also, is it a problem? Is it all part of the changing attitudes? Do we legislate against it or do we actually just try and educate people to change their attitude towards past offences? 
It's one of the considerations is can we even legislate against mm -hmm. it? Um, the Google effect is moderately well documented and uh, you've got evidence submissions, I believe, from Recruit with Conviction, um, from Unlock, the charity which is predominantly in England and Wales, and I think a number of the things that you've highlighted are worthwhile doing um, in concert with one another in terms of broader awareness raising with employers about anti-discrimination measures and the meaning not only um, the buffer periods, but the meaning of the information that might be yielded from that um, in terms of what it might be relevant to them or perhaps not relevant to them to try and tackle some of this, the systemic stigma um, when we actually need uh, people with convictions to be able to access the labour market, to work, to have a routine, to have a legitimate and legal income that might contribute to the tax base um, and not be having the other options. And so I would very much so support the calls that have talked about broader awareness raising, work with employers that may potentially have to be done at the UK wide uh, a level as well as locally to get the awareness raising to the benefits um, and also some frank conversations around what might pose a risk and why, what might not because I wouldn't say that all employers are broadly setting out to be prejudiced against people with convictions um, but some other jurisdictions have um, moved with more guidance and implementation in the US and in Australia to say actually unless it is unless the conviction is highly relevant to the occupational role, to the crime type, to the time since it was convicted, that considering all of this forever could potentially be discriminatory and a barrier to people's uh, employment and social integration. Because if we don't support um, their desistance from crime, their social in integration and their access to legitimate sources of income, that poses an issue for public protection. And then we've got an even bigger public conversation to be had. Anyone else? I'm just thinking I have colleagues who research cybercrime and forever telling me about the dark net as a social movement and that we can legislate the Google effect, but I, I think it'd be incredibly difficult to try and also wrangle what's going on in these sort of separate areas beyond legislation. Yes, social media is a bit like bandit country, but I, th I think the point about raising awareness and thinking about it more broadly is probably, it's it's certainly a, it's a longer game. It, can't just be tackled with legislation. It's something we have to have a robust conversation about. But I, again, I agree with Dr. Graham that I'm not sure it's something that we can necessarily legislate for. Mm -hmm. But practitioners have a view on that because I'm here. We're hearing from people. Well, Ed, Douglas said earlier about explaining terminology and perhaps publishing some guide, guide, guidance for employers, along with uh, if the act comes into force, about exactly what what is a summary conviction, what is an admonition. Because some, some people have no experience of criminal justice and might assume that well, someone has a conviction that, that they're a criminal. And perhaps just making it clear about what these disposals mean. Um, and it, it, like an admonition that if it's one conviction, it's, it's one conviction. And exactly what the powers in a summary court are, it's not necessarily as bad as it looks on in, in first blush. Okay. Sorry, George. Okay, it was just to add, convener, uh, the fact that. If someone does uh, Google, uh, uh, an employer Google someone that's in front of them, the problem is the information they're getting, we, we could educate them, we could make things better, but the problem is that uh, a lot of the information you're talking about uh, there uh, will not actually be in the newspaper report because it will be a sensationalised version of it, in many cases, not in all. And uh, the problem is trying to get people onto that side. You know, it's, it's more of an education of maybe uh, the, the local press in some cases, that they understand what's happening in the local courts as well. And I was just wondering, how, how do we get to that place where we're, we're having that kind of mature discussion? Trying to get the press to uh, not report sensationalist stories, mm. I think, would be extremely difficult. Impossible. Yeah, I think I can't think of anything immediately. Uh -huh. <laughs> but maybe for the next bill, what we'll be having a round table for. <laughs> George, it's Finn. Uh, well, no, no, it was just, it was just yeah. to add the fact that all I was trying to say was the fact that, you know, we're talking about education there, but it's more than just the, the society in general. It's not just the, the one uh, kind of like group of employers that we use there or anything like that. And that's a difficulty. You know, just to add that point. Okay, thank you. Maddie? 
really just had some questions, and it was around the parole board, and I know that a few of you had talked about that in your written submissions uh, to the committee, but I was just wondering if, if somebody wanted to outline, first of all, exactly how it operates at the moment and what those changes will mean, um, because there were a few things that interested me uh, in the submissions, and one element in particular was in relation to, I think it was the, the Law Society, where you stated... Uh, it was about in the relation to the recall of prisoners released on home detention curfew and how the limitation of that's going to change, uh, is going to change. And I know you talk about you don't have the figures. I don't know if anybody else on the panel is aware of uh, how that operates at the moment. So I don't know who wants to take that on at first. So it might be appropriate. Yeah. I was a member of the parole board in between 2001 and 2007. And I was there for a member when the original Management of Offenders Scotland Act came into force. And when the re-release panel of the board uh, first became involved in determining cases where persons had been uh, brought back into custody for breach of uh, home detention curfews. And as I hinted at earlier, the very early teething stages of that was a particularly difficult time for the board because the quality of information was not good and the time period for information to become available was sometimes far greater than it should have been. We were dealing and we will still be dealing in respect of home detention curfew cases with people who are subject to that for a maximum period of I think it's 162 days, something around that figure, it's around five months. Now, if during that period there's an alleged breach of that and their licence is revoked immediately, then if the matter is to be challenged, they have an entitlement to have that determined by a quasi-judicial body as soon as possible. And it, I think things have improved a great deal since I came off the board in 2007, but it can mean somebody sitting in custody for some weeks when there's a very coherent, very simple case can be put forward in respect of the circumstances of their alleged non-compliance. Okay, in terms of the general workings of the Parole Board, though, and some of the other changes that are proposed, I mean, are you able to tell us a bit more detail about that as well? And I know in terms of the appointments and are the changes that you see, are other changes that you see proposed here, are they welcomed? Some of them do seem to be, be good, good ideas. And uh, w one issue which uh, is has proved controversial and is perhaps worthy of comment is that there is a difference in terms of the test for re-release of a determinate sentence prisoner, a life prisoner and an extended sentence prisoner. Now that's based upon the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights and based upon English appellate case law and uh, it is perhaps a little anomalous that uh, the, when somebody is serving a life sentence, the question is whether it is necessary for the protection of the public. But when somebody is serving an extended sentence, the test is whether it is necessary for the protection of the public from risk of serious harm. Now, it is a little anomalous that the two uh, tests are slightly different, and I do not think that it would be created or likely to create injustice if there were a uniform test for when a person is fit to be released from custody when the public would be felt to be adequately protected. I think the, the serious harm test, while, there is a, while it has a logic behind it, in practical terms, I suspect that the board continues, as it did when I was a member, to apply everyday common sense to the situation. If you have a concern that somebody is not yet at a position where they can safely be re released back into society, then the terminology is not really the key and it's not necessarily helpful. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rangan, I don't know if you want to comment, uh, because I noticed that there was quite a lot in your submission relating to the parole boards as well, and if you want to respond to any of that. Well, I, I suppose our, just the few comments we made about the parole board was there was just one small section in there saying that revocations to prison, a prisoner's ability to, um, to investigate or to appeal that was going to be reduced from five years to six months. And that seemed to me incredibly dramatic. And I'm not sure if it's been brought up anywhere else. And the justification is retention of paperwork, but that would just totally contravene the statute of limitations, surely, and someone's rights to 
appeal a appeal something. So I I I, I thought Sorry, more. Uh, do you have any information on that though? Because I'm aware in the Law Society submission they talked about well needing more of the figures around that. Do you know? I mean, how many people that would affect at the moment, or the length of time that? No, no, I don't. I'm actually trying do. to get a, okay a date on this about temporary releases and recalls. But even if it's just for a handful of people, it does seem quite serious mm -hmm. to think. You enter the prison, you go through a certain amount of um, bureaucracy and settling in, and I, that first six months can pass incredibly quickly, and all of a sudden you are still amped up about what you feel is an, in, an unjust recall, and your, your right to appeal that is now gone. So I, and that element of the change to parole, I just thought that was quite serious and needed to be highlighted and justified much more strongly above the retention of paperwork by SBS. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Daniel. I'd just um, like to begin by following up on, on uh, some things that Douglas Thompson was just saying there about the, the test. Indeed, the Pro Board submission uh, went to some length, uh, I think, it was expressing a degree of dissatisfaction with the bill. Uh, and, I mean, would you agree with their point of view that we could do with greater clarity? And then, moreover, obviously, the role of the Pro Board has... I think had a degree of increased kind of uh, scrutiny given the war boys case uh, in, in England. D do you think that having greater clarity around these questions is not just useful for the parole board themselves, but actually serves a, a transparency role? And I'm just wondering if there are any other reflections given the, 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 the details of the war boys case you or any other panelists might have. Uh, at the outset, I would observe that it's unlikely that the Scottish board would have reached the same decision as the members of the English board did because our systems, because of the existence of the Risk Management Authority and the way that the McLean Committee uh, approached the deal with orders for lifelong restriction were considerably more robust and considerably much more ECHR, ECHR compliant than the English IPPs that uh, were, became so discredited. So the Scottish board has been dealing with a much more robust risk management system than the English board and has therefore had a much better quality of information. I have seen some old style English parole dossiers which were very much in a tick box format where a, you came to pages and pages and all it was was a series of boxes and it was whichever box had a black dot in it. Scottish dossiers have always been based upon written information, including impressions of the prisoner, psychological risk assessments, and so on. Moving from the, the, the situation of, of war boys, I think it's important that the board does become more transparent. And I think that the board could become, could open its hearings to the public. The board could uh, make its decisions albeit in a redacted format, available to the public, because there will be information contained in a parole board decision minute. Uh, and it, it was formerly the prisoner received a letter, now the board issues a minute. Now, these minutes can be fairly easily redacted to avoid any reference to particular individuals or particular matters regarding the crime that are not for public uh, consumption. But if the board's decisions can be made known to the public in that way, then the public can have a greater degree of understanding of how the board works, which may in some way increase confidence in the operation of the board. I think that's quite an interesting suggestion in terms of the publication of minutes. I mean, is that something or are there any other thoughts around transparency that any other members of the, the panel might have? Particularly, yeah. No? Uh, you don't have to. So the other the critical question, I think, uh, regarding the parole board is its independence. And again, this is something that the parole board submission uh, went to some length, I think, expressing some concern. Uh, I think the sentiment being that while there are provisions uh, around it, uh, its status and independence, that they could be more substantial and certainly put on a, an equivalent footing to other aspects of the court system. Uh, again, I was just wondering whether or not, and obviously particular, Mr. Thompson, whether or not you had views, but again, if there are any other views from the panel, I would be interested in them. The parole board tribunal system is in a, it's a very odd part of the Scottish legal system. It's called a tribunal, but it doesn't form part of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Mm -hmm. And there is no automatic appellate process from the decision of the parole board. So it sits in a rather ad hoc position. It was created in 1967 in a very different world. Uh, and it was 
created a to fill a fill a gap that was perceived following some decisions or some cases that took place in England at the time and Scotland effectively tagged along with England at the time and uh, we've moved on considerably since then. The board in Scotland has had a greater degree of autonomy than the board in England. The appointment process for members in Scotland was uh, improved considerably in the 2001 Act uh, and uh, members had security of tenure in Scotland and the Scottish Board has never been part of the, uh, I think it was the probation service that actually ran or, or funded the parole board in England and Wales. There has been a greater degree of independence, but because the board's not yet on a formal statutory footing, its position is not easy to understand. You can't find anywhere a piece of legislation that sets out what the parole board does. It has its rules, which are by and form a statutory instrument, but uh, with the exception of the 2001 Act and the current bill, there's nothing that sets out what the parole board does. And the tribunal system has effectively developed by increments a, and as a result of court decisions. And I think that there would be some merit in placing the board, I think the, the board say this themselves, yes, placing indeed. the board on a formal statutory footing and perhaps to consider whether the parole board tribunal system is put on a statutory footing and becomes part of SCTS and maybe has some form of appellate process. Because at the moment, if someone is aggrieved by a decision of the parole board, you have to go from the criminal system into the civil system by way of judicial review, and that creates certain difficulties as well. I mean, again, is that a, 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 a suggestion that any other panel members have views on? No, you don't have I'm to. I'm conscious the clock is ticking and we, we, we haven't. The only point the Heritage Scotland wanted to raise about this in relation to our submission was that the parole board are, are increasingly less likely to give parole. This also explains our rising prison numbers. And that should be something in thinking about wanting to reconstitute it. How do we get people out of the prison system? Right now, Scotland has Europe, and not the Council of Europe's largest life sentence prisoner population, and our prison yeah. sentence getting longer and longer. And part of that is because people simply can't get out of prison. We have, I'm again trying to get statistics on this, hundreds of prisoners serving over tariff. That means they're serving longer than the punishment part of their sentence because they can't receive release. So thinking about the parole board again, also about its constitution, about its aims and its agenda is a way again to think about Scotland's staggeringly high imprisonment rate. Which again, I mean, if the minutes were published and, and it's, it's uh, root rationale given would, would help certainly, I think, delve into to some of those issues I'd have thought. Yeah. One, one issue that does arise so one issue that does arise from that is that I think the large number of lifers is very much skewed by the number of recalled prisoners at the present time. The number of prisoners who have been recalled for non-compliance with their licence eh, has increased dramatically in the last few years. I was at a Howard League lecture fairly recently eh, given by Dr Van Zyl Smith and eh, he was observing and I think I made some comments at that about the, the number of prisoners who are in custody now not because of the original sentence, but because of their non-compliance with licence conditions. And I think that perhaps brings us full circle back to electronic monitoring and whether there are systems that could be put in place that would better monitor the risk and better monitor the compliance with licence of these persons. And that could, in reality, reduce the number of people who are currently going back into custody and very often spending two, three and four years in custody when they've not done anything particularly serious, but have been non-compliant with supervision. That's a very helpful insight. Thank you. Full, full circle. Very brief um, supplementary from Liam McCarthy, and then our last questioning from Morris. Uh, thanks very much. I was just following up Mr Thompson's earlier point about the way in which the Parole Board in Scotland um, takes decisions, perhaps in comparison to its counterpart south of the border. So there was a more substantive assessment and, and um, the, the, the input, in a sense, gave a, a, a better reflection of, of future risk. In that sense, are there any concerns that you would have about the, the removal of the requirement to have a psychiatrist on the, on the parole board? One would assume that the removal of high court judge, well, at least one would have um, sort of uh, legal expertise well covered, but, but um, psychiatric input would seem to be fairly essential, would it not, as part of that assessment? There will be a number of parole board tribunals, there are a number of life sentence prisoners eh, and some determinate sentence prisoners who will be in hospital 
at the time they come up for consideration for parole. So to that extent, there is a, a benefit. When I chaired tribunals in a, the state hospital, I chaired a few there over my time on the board, it was always helpful to have somebody there with a psychiatric background because there may be issues upon which they would be the best person to question the doctor in charge of the prisoner about the, the management because you were concerned in that situation with somebody who would be potentially going from hospital back to prison or going from hospital back into the community. And there were issues arising because sometimes the prisoner would also be subject to the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act. Mm -hmm. So while it's a minority of cases, there is merit in my view in there still being somebody who can give psychiatric input when the case has a psychiatric element. So you, you would, in a sense, prefer to see that provision dropped from the... From I, the I, think, I think that uh, a psychiatric member, uh, given that the members are part-time, I think a psychiatric member is a good thing. Anybody else have any view on that? No. Thanks. Morris. Thank you. Yeah, um, with, with reference to the functions of the parole board regarding uh, prisoners themselves, does the panel have any concerns about the proposed changes affecting the functions of the parole board in this regard? I leave it open to any of you to come back on that. Can somebody else speak now? <laughs> <laughs> um, do I take that as you have no concerns? Well, I wouldn't say we. I wouldn't say we've got we've got no concerns. I don't. I don't want to monopolise the the last part of the part of the session. The, clearly, I, much of my work at present time does involve conducting tribunals as a representative now. Uh, so I have some day-to-day -day hands on experience of how the, how the board operates and I'm a little reluctant to put my personal views before the committee because I am here as a representative of the Law Society because anything I would be saying would be based upon my private practice as opposed to a general society view. So I prefer perhaps not to answer that question on behalf of the Law Society of Scotland. Right, okay. Does anybody want to add to that? A note of that. Oh, no, right. okay. Thank you. And that completes our line of questioning. Um, can I think it's been a very long session, so I thank you for your forbearance. But the information we've got from that, the direction we've gone, uh, we have um, gone in, has been extremely helpful. So can I thank you all for your attendance today? We'll have a, a suspension now and a comfort break, and resume in about five to ten minutes. <laughs>
Agenda item three is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting on the 10th of May 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. So I refer members to paper three, which is a note by Clark, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Convener, um, as you'll be aware, the, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 10th of May and we took evidence on Police Scotland's proposed use of uh, digital triage systems. Uh, now, that's more commonly been referred to in the press as cyber kiosks and uh, people may be familiar with that term. We took evidence from two individuals. We took evidence from Detective Superintendent Nicola Burnett from Police Scotland and Mr Kenneth Hogg, who's the Interim Chief Officer at uh, the Scottish Police Authority. Now, we, we were interested in the acquisition of this equipment. Um, what assessments had been done in advance, uh, um, and um, it turns out that on 2nd May um, this year, the Scottish Police Authority agreed Police Scotland's three-year implementation plan titled Serving a Changing Scotland, Creating Ca Capacity to Improve, and that particular plan included a proposal to, major, uh, to manage cybercrime with uh, kiosks to triage data um, from devices locally. Um, now, in 2016, Police Scotland conducted trials um, of the Celebrite digital device triage system, both in um, Edinburgh and Stirling, and uh, the um, subcommittees requested information on the analysis undertaken and whether any uh, issues were raised. Um, what we did here was that, <coughs> excuse me, that there was no human rights, data protection, or indeed community impasse uh, assessments undertaken prior to these trials. Um, and uh, the Police Scotland's selected Celebrate product and anticipates rolling out 41 kiosks across the force area later this year. Uh, they gave us an assurance that these assessments, equality, human rights, data protections, will be undertaken, officers trained and issues addressed before the rollout of the kiosks. Uh, and they say the anticipated date of the introduction is uh, autumn 2018. Now, there was a cumulative spend of about a million pounds in relation to this and the particular trials um, involved uh, interaction with over 600 uh, devices, um, SIM cards and the like. <clears throat> and it's fair to say that, um, that um, there were a considerable number of questions that came out that members had, um, and uh, these have been put in a letter which has gone off to, to Police Scotland, uh, a, a somewhat lengthy letter seeking uh, information there. Um, we sought to be reassured, and I, I think it's well, let me own the statement. I certainly wasn't reassured with what I heard. It, it created more questions. Um, we also considered uh, convening our forward work programme and agreed to schedule an evidence session on Police Scotland's firearms licensing process. Um, and uh, we will be returning to Police Scotland's digital data and ICT strategy prior to the summer recess. I'm very yeah. happy to take any questions. So. Thank you. Do members have any questions or comments to, to make Liam, uh, Liam MacArthur? Uh, thanks, Owen. Just to echo um, John's sentiments in terms of the conclusion of the, the evidence session, I think, as, as he rightly says, that there seem to be more questions raised than necessarily answered. Provide that's not to say I don't think all of us accepted there were benefits and fairly clear benefits outlined from use of technology. But uh, I think all of us were, um, I, I think, seized to the need to ensure that all of the, the safeguards uh, that are appropriate are in place before there's any national rollout to this. Yeah, I think that's certainly the case, that we, they weren't able to answer certain questions. And I think there was a real concern about procurement maybe taking place before um, they'd really looked at how data is stored at present and uh, any pitfalls. So it was a good subject to look at and one which uh, we will be pursuing. Right, that being the case, we now move into private session. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 22nd of May, when we'll be continuing our evidence taking on the Management of Offenders Bill. So uh, I suspend briefly, there's nobody here, we, we move into private session. <laughs>